Good evening. Friends, welcome to Plymouth Church. Uh, my name is Peter Lucky. I'm the senior pastor here at Plymouth. And we are so pleased to join as a partner in this year's Read Across the Lawrence program centered on Mary Robinson's novel Housekeeping. And speaking of housekeeping, uh, this is a little segue pun, but we invite you or ask you to please turn off any cell phones uh, so that we're not interrupted during the evening. If you could do that, that would be a great help. And also, number two, uh, there is a survey. We ask you to fill that out. That's a survey HP. If you return that to one of the ushers tonight, that would be terrific. First of all, I want to thank our Read Across Lawrence Partners, the Lawrence Public Library, Friends of the Library, KU Libraries, the Hall Center for Humanities, in addition, we have a special shout-out that goes to the Elbridge Hotel, which provided Maryland's accommodations during her visit to Lawrence, along with a whole host of local businesses. Finally, I want to recognize tonight Lucia Orr uh, in her relationship to Maryland and the key role that she played uh, in bringing Marilyn Robinson here to Lawrence. I want to just say, what an honor it is to have Mary Robinson speaking with us tonight and how fitting that she is here in this old abolitionist congregation at Plymouth Church because abolitionism is something that Marilyn has studied extensively. And as we think about the power, when we think about our history and our struggle for freedom, we recognize the power of words. Writers like Harriet Beecher Stowe in the 19th century, or preachers and writers like Martin Luther King Jr. What we recognize tonight, it seems to me, is the power of words to change lives. This last July, Marilyn Robinson was honored uh, with the National Humanities Medal at the White House. And at the White House reception, our president said to that group gathered here, there, these National Humanities Medal awardees, including Mary Robinson, he said, your writings have changed me, I think, for the better. And then the president turned directly to the novelist Mary Robinson and said, Marilyn, I believe that. That's terrific. The power of words. It's not only the president that has felt the power of Marilyn's words, but I can speak for many preachers, Marilyn, speak of how your words from time to time have shaped our lives, especially, and I know this is hard for you to believe, when we run out of our own words. <laughs> when our wells run dry. Not only do we turn to God and turn to Scripture, but many of us turn to Mary Robinson for she is like a glass of water for parched pastors. <laughs> and why? Why is it that we turn to Marilyn Robinson when we look for inspiration in her preaching? I'll tell you why. It comes down to one word. Because Marilyn helps us appreciate the truth of incarnation. She reminds us that in every moment of our lives, in the everyday moments of our living, from sunsets to a hell hand, that if we pay attention, we can glimpse glimpses of the holy and sacred in every moment of our lives. 
and you only have to read one of her novels or one of her essays to understand how true that is. One of my favorite novels is the novel Gilead, which of course, as many of you know, Reverend John Ames is writing a letter to his son so that his son will have something to remember after he's gone. The novel written in the form of a letter by Reverend John Ames. But there's a wonderful scene in that novel which, speaking of water, reminds us of the transcendence that's around us all the time in the everyday ordinary. Reverend John Ames is walking to church, and above him, ahead of him, is a couple walking ahead of him. And this is what he writes. This is what Marilyn writes. The sun had come up brilliantly after a heavy rain, and the trees were glistening and very wet. On some impulse, plain exuberance, I suppose, the fellow jumped up and caught hold of a branch, and a storm of luminous water came pouring down on the two of them, and they laughed and took off running, the girl sweeping water off her hair and her dress as if she were a little bit disgusted, but she wasn't. It was a beautiful thing to see, like something from a myth. I don't know why I thought of that now, except perhaps because it is easy to believe in such moments that water was made primarily for blessing and only secondarily for growing vegetables or doing the wash. I wish I had paid more attention to it. This is an interesting planet that deserves all the attention you can get. That's the words of Mary Robinson. The power of words to transform our lives. What a treat it is to have Mary with us tonight. I would like to introduce to you Lorraine Herricom, Dean of the KU Libraries, who will introduce Mary and Red Owl. Lorraine.
He has worked as a children's librarian, a teen librarian, subject specialist, branch manager, and now executive director. His library career has taken him to Los Angeles, the Seattle area, and back to his native Kansas. Tonight, Brad will be facilitating a discussion with our guest upon him, Marilyn Robinson. As one might imagine from reading her work, Marilyn Robinson is passionately tied to the dramatic Northwest landscape of her childhood. She was born in Sandpoint, Idaho, where her family had lived for four generations. Her grandparents were farmers and ranchers. Her father was in the local industry. Dr. Robinson is the recipient of the uh, 2012 National Humanities Medal, awarded by President Barack Obama for her grace and intelligence in writing. She's the author of Iliad, we know of the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, and the National Book Critics Circle Award and Home, which won the Orange Prize and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Her first novel, Housekeeping, won the Hemingway Foundation Pen Award and was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Her forthcoming novel, Lila, is set in the same fictional world as Gilead and Home. Robinson's nonfiction books include When I Was a Child, I Read Books, Absence of Mind, The Death of Adam, and Mother Country, which was nominated for a National Book Award. She was, she was born and um, grew up in Idaho, as I said, before moving to Providence, Rhode Island, to study English at Brown University. And then she went on to earn a PhD in English at the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Robinson teaches at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop and of course lives in, in Iowa City. We are absolutely delighted to have her here with us tonight and it's a pleasure to turn the program over to Brad Allen. Before we do so, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Putting little passages of housekeeping 
in that dresser, in that, in that soundboard drawer in the dining room, um, not knowing that I was actually beginning it. When I had finished the dissertation and then took them out and looked at them, I realized that they did go here around the mood and the, you know, the, the place that I was concerned with trying to evoke them. So I went to teach in, in France uh, on an exchange after I finished my dissertation. And uh, not long after I arrived at the university, I went on strike. And it was a very prolonged strike. Different, different groups would go on strike, parallel the university over again. And um, I actually had a big time to write. And um, I was living in a, in a farmhouse in the country. And uh, it was, you know, a French house that has windows that go all the way to the You know, the doors are windows, the windows are doors, it goes all the way to the floor. And there were little uh, farm kids that lived around there for whom Americans were extremely exotic beings. And so they would come and wrap up the glass like it was aquarium glass. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I found this distracting. And so I went into a, a little back room and I closed the shutters on the door so the room was absolutely black. And I had a little wobbly uh, like lab bedside lamp and a spiral book. And I started writing from taking off from a place for at least my first book. And uh, it, was, it was a very strange experience because I would be in the absolute darkness. I would think to myself, I'm the only person in the universe who is in a dark room in France remembering my <laughs> But I found that under those circumstances, my memory was startlingly repeat, um, which was a great part of the satisfaction of writing the book. It probably had a great deal to do with the quality of the book, you know, the character of it. Um, I assumed I was writing an unpublishable book. Um, I've been reading, you know, the New York Times book review so much, and I was writing something that I knew was completely unlike what's in here in print, I uh, was naive enough to think that was a disadvantage. Um, I spent the rest of my career trying to tell my, my students, no, it's an advantage. But in any case, um, I wrote this book. I finished it in Massachusetts. I gave it to a friend of mine who had written a book. He wanted to read it. And he sent it to a, an agent without telling me he'd done it. So the first information that I had was a letter from the agent saying, this will be hard to place, but I'd have to represent it. And then she gave it to Ferris Johnson Giroux, and the first editor who read it, accepted it, and said, this will be very, this won't get any reviews, but I uh, have to publish it. <laughs> and then, uh, then I got a big review of the New York Times that said, no one else is going to review this. <laughs> That's basically how the book came to be. Well, I, I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit more about um, your, you know, writing the book in, in isolation somewhat, or writing it and kind of out of the context of seeing it as something that's publishable. And um, one thing that I've heard you mention before is that um, since you were writing it for yourself, you, there are many jokes, at least to yourself, that, that were embedded in that, uh, where the book is has a reputation for being rather serious. We talk about loss and all of these things. So I was wondering, you know, are there parts of the book that, that you found funny um, that you feel like no one gets or finds quite serious and that, that there are these gems in there that... Gems? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> or just that, you know, you, tell, you, 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 you say something that you, that you find funny to yourself and then are there parts that you think are very humorous that nobody has mentioned? Well, you know, I mean, it is, it's a book with a burden of sadness. There's no question about that. But then that doesn't, you know, prevent it from having its humorous moments, I hope. But these little private jokes I would make to myself were things like, 
Every major scene occurs in more or less absolute darkness. And that was, because I was convinced I was not only writing an unpublishable book, but one that would never be filmed. Now you have to admit that's a pretty arcane joke. <laughs> but if you notice, I mean, the train wreck, you know, moonless light, people, the only survivors of it are standing at the end of the train going backward, et cetera, et cetera. All these sorts of uh, visual jokes uh, of that kind. You know, uh, what can I say? I mean, uh, I was amusing myself at a certain level. You do when you write, you know? I mean, you can, you can think, uh, how can I make this work? And then an incredible word or a wonderful analogy comes to your mind. And it seems like something that just drifted down into the sky, you know? And you think, that this is the best thing that's happened to me in my life. Well, that's an exaggeration. But you're in that sort of mood when you're writing, you know? I mean, you can't believe. There's an interaction between, between yourself and whatever it is that precipitates the fiction. Um, and it's surprising to as a writer. And I think practically anywhere I can say that. That the engagement at its deepest is one where you feel surprised by what you do, by what happens on the page. No, I love that though. One of my, when you describe the, the training, um, one of the, or thing that I found, I don't know, funny humor or whatever, it's that it was a spectacular event, yet it wasn't at all because there were no spectators. Just playing with the word, it's just the humor and the tragedy, but it, it's, it's just a great lie. And, um, there's just a lot, I don't know, there's so much stuff. Um, but another question I wanted to know, because you know the book threads, its, the word threads itself throughout the book, um, tell us a little bit more about just the, um, the title of the book and why it was titled Housekeeping. Was that something that you, you knew that it was going to be at its inception, or the editor said that it was going to be, or you know, how, did, how was this book made? Well, when I was about two-thirds of the way through it, it was simply named Housekeeping. Um, again, that's one of those things where, you know, when you, I don't know how many people in the audience right? But um, there are things that happen, and they are uh, they happen on the authority of yes, how how do you explain this? Uh, I got a lot of advice from people that this was a terrible name for a book. I got you know I got lists lists of better names. I mean, bless their hearts. People really tried to try to lose from this name, but it simply was the name of the book. And uh, it makes, to me, it makes sense because uh, I find, you know, the keeping of the house, in many senses of the phrase, is a difficult thing to do, you know? Uh, civilization depends on the fact that we do it more or less unthinkingly. There's nothing simple about it. It's absolutely crucial. It's the little, you know, ground up. <laughs> I don't need to remind anybody now of kind of a hostile planet. And we create these little artificial tropics you know, where we can reproduce, <laughs> nurture, you know, uh, cultivate ourselves and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a, the, the great human artifice is really the making of shelter. And then every other artifice is secondary to that. So, um, you know, it, I mean, I, I wanted the title. It made sense to me when it occurred to me. Um, I knew that it might not be the most marketable title in the world, but then I was the title of an unpublishable book. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I would hear stories about housekeeping being in the how-to section. <laughs> <laughs> there, there should be how-not-to sections in the bookstore. Um, the uh, stories about men who would put it, you know, ask for a bag and put it in and say, hey, you want a busy party? You go to the store with a book called Housekeeping. <laughs> uh, all these things happened, and uh, then, frankly, it just became the name of the book, and all those issues, I think, pretty well evaporated. Um, is there any particular reason for the name Fingerbomb? Um, I'm just intrigued by that name. Is there, you know, where did that come from? Um, in the place where I grew up, 
things tended to be named after body parts, you know, <laughs> flathead leg, ear bob leg, as a powder leg means, you know, um, nest person, pier, you know, pierced nose, all these kinds of things. Um, and so it seemed to me maybe to the place that it should um, have that kind of quality, a kind of relic, you know. Um, and then also, oddly enough, when I was a very young child, probably three, I was watching my father change the tire, the old way, you know, and the tire iron. And it was very cold, and he dropped the tire iron, and it fell from end to end three times, surprising me equal syllables. And to me, it sounded like the word finger bowl. And, you know, that's been in my mind. Who knows what? One of the things that's great about writing, which I recommend to everybody, is you have no idea what is in your mind until you start tapping on it in that way. <laughs> Oh, you know, as I said before, I have very little 
of notion of readers when I wrote it. My mother and my brother were my primary audience at that point, neither of whom saw the book until after it was published, by the way. Um, but I, you know, I don't quite see the, the events of the novel as situated in a conventional, I mean, in a tangible reality, in the degree that, that readers often seem to do. Um, it's not, it's something other. It's a, I think, I mean, when I was writing it, I was aware that uh, so many of the stories that I heard about my family settlement there were stories about women. And um, when I was in Rhode Island looking at the place from a distance, I realized that they could not imagine the presence of women in this kind of environment. Um, and I, I thought of it as, in a way, as it being a spirit, you know, a spirit that, that uh, fills towns and haunts woods and so on because of these stories that I've heard. And uh, to a very great extent, um, this sort of spirit environment uh, that I had in my mind that was like the music in a way uh, that, that drifted over the landscape rather than it's being something reducible to sociology. Um, and so I thought of it more as a sort of musical resolution in a certain sense than as a, you know, a, a realistic ending. Um, that's all I can say. Things dictate their endings. And you can't create the world, you can't snatch people out of it. They are of that world. You can't interfere in that way. And it had the ending that I thought it needed. What well, would you like to read a piece? Okay. Or for the novel? All right. Um,
Though we dream in perfect knowing, longing like an angel fosters us, smooths our hair, and brings us wild strawberries. Sylvie was gone. She had left without a word or a sound. I thought she must be teasing, perhaps watching me from the woods. I pretended not to know I was alone. I could see if I still thought children might come here. Any child who saw once the gleaming water spill to the tips of branches and round and broad and pop the soft and shadows across at the foot of each tree would come to see it again. If there had been snow, I would have made a statue, a woman to stand along the path among the trees. The children would have come close to look at her. Lot's wife was soft and barren because she was full of loss and mourning and looked bad. But here where flowers were gleam in her hair and on her breast and in her hands, and there would be children all around her to love and marvel at her for her beauty and to laugh at her extravagant adornments as if they had set the flowers in her hair and thrown down all the flowers in her feet. And they would forgive her eagerly, lavishly, for turning away, though she never asked to be forgiven. Though her hands were ice and did not touch them, she would be more than mother to them. She's so calm, so still, and they such wild and important things. <laughs> Um, so he set about making this film. 
uh, he was he would send me the script because we were pretending that it was collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I would make tiny little comments on the script because I had no illusions about how to make a movie. But I thought he should know that I was in fact looking at these things he sent me. So I'd send him that. He would ignore it. He never took any advice of mine at all, and I was more than content with that. Um, he stayed very close to the, to the book, I think as close as he could. Um, they made funny mistakes. Uh, they were all Scots, the whole film crew, everybody. And they had no idea where they were in terms of you know, being in the Northwest in November in the mountains, you know. So um, they, they, they put a great importance on the scene that I just read from this falling house. They, they, they went into South Dakota. They found a house that had fallen into its foundations. They photographed it from a million angles. They purchased it. They put it on the truck. They took it up a mountain. They reconstructed it as it had fallen. And then it got very cold. And since they had child actresses, they didn't feel that they could expose them to this cold for any length of time. So the scene that they had most invested in, in all sorts of senses of the word, they couldn't really do. You know, uh, they had a wonderful time of raiding St. Vincent's to get free couches and bureaus and so on. Uh, they built this house in the, they, it was like billboards, you know, they were basically two sides of the house. Uh, it had telephone lines ran into it with little rents nests hanging from it. I mean, it was ridiculous. The neighbors, they actually bought an orchard of scrubbing the orchard, brought it in and they planted it by this house that they had visited two walls of the house. The neighbors thought that the house had always been there and they had just cleared, it, cleared away the trees that had never secured it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean they did a they did a very, very lovely, careful job working within within limits that they had not anticipated. And uh, I went to visit the set in Canada, Nelson um, and uh, they had Thanksgiving dinner for me, which I thought was lovely because it wasn't Thanksgiving in Canada. The fourth prophet never knows. And uh, but the other thing is that they they knew it was my birthday, you know. And uh, Sylvie mentions my birthday, November twenty sixth, in the film. There are all these little delicate, uh, lovely gestures that I. You know, people always have horror stories about films. I have no horror stories. It was all charming, estimable. And I think it's a good thing. It's basically an art school, you know. 
but we have a very good opportunity to actually see people into successful careers in the art that we choose, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I can't, I, I wish that I, I wish that I were in Idaho, but it's not. <laughs>
And I wanted to ask you um, about a little bit, um, maybe almost kind of what you, to, to what you just said, but what do you think that, that we have to be hopeful for today and, and into the future? Well, you know, I mean, people, people are a rough crowd. You know what I mean? <laughs> And one of the things that they were 
very aware. It's their own critics that bring it to human beings. You know, this is not change. We just don't explore it, we don't value it, you know. No. But, you know, you make something, the, the kinds of things they make, like libraries and universities and thought systems and all the rest of it, they did that for other people. They did it in the profoundest respect for other people. If we don't respect, if we don't have an imagination of, of a human population, that it would be a, a joy to honor with the best gifts that we can give it. We're not going to lose anything. You don't have it. It's, it's, you can't, if you don't think there is anyone to receive the best that you can give, you're not going to give much, right? You will not even try. Well, we can we can take some more questions from, from the audience. I know there were there's a gentleman up here in the front and, and a gentleman over there as well. Um, since well, since we're on a church, I have a question about the Christian imagery as well as even the passage you read from the Christian uh, Lot's wife, uh, and something kind of alluded to life beyond this life. So generally. Generally speaking, where does that Christian imagery come from, or religious or spiritual imagery come from, from your life, or what parts of playing your books? And specifically, what does, uh, can you speak about the idea of the ordinary or the mundane being maybe sacred or holy? And I'm thinking about even John Ames with the biscuit being his first case of a sacrament, even though it was an ordinary thing, it was kind of special and sacred for him. So what part does that play in your book, and what does that imagery, the religious imagery, play in your novels and your work? Can you just talk about that for a bit? Well, you know, if I had to spend my life on one thing, if I had to devote the rest of my life to one thing, it would be theology and scripture. I studied them years and years and years, I think that they are, I mean, what they articulate, what they give me a language to approach in terms of understanding is uh, extremely uh, beautiful and essential to me. Um, I can't really imagine that I would write much of anything. I can't imagine writing anything that didn't have theological substratum or superstructure or something. Simply so because that's the way my mind works. Partly as a consequence of my interest, and partly as a consequence of the fact that I have had the pleasure of gratifying my interests over a long period of time. Um, I, you know, I, this is my tradition. I feel very at home in this church. Um, but it comes out of the Reformation uh, impulse to make the most sacred things in the society the most available to the most urban. And so that, you know, the Kindle the Great Bible translator said that uh, he wanted to make a translation that the plowboy could read, that the, so the plowboy would be as learned as any edition. You know? And the things like Pierce Plowman and so on, there, there's a very strong sort of tradition of, of finding the sacred in the utterly common case. Um, and uh, that seems right to me because I, I feel as if sacred permeates reality. And that, you know, we make great, you know, structures around it and so on, but it doesn't need the structures. It doesn't mean that, you know, the animals are so as they are. It is simply inherent in, especially in the sort of unacknowledged sacramental quality of character of the people. Giving them the spirit. Thank you for coming this evening. My question is, and it was the first time I read anything that you were kind of, you have a narrator with me who obviously is telling a story, and I couldn't quite piece all the parts together of the context in which she was telling the story, because the story ranges at least very obviously from her very young childhood to her teen years. Um, 
language that she uses that she uses to describe this story is sounds of somebody somewhat more mature. So can you tell us more about Ruby and where she learns from? Um, I don't um, as I said before, you know, um, I don't intend this, the kind of literalism in this novel that is not off characters in the modern novels. I'm kind of doing something else. Um, one of the things, I mean, she is um, quite an unlimited narrator by the time I'm telling the book. Um, there are little jokes that I made with myself about what she could say. The passage that I read about the Carthage soul itself um, and then the, the, the fusion of vegetation with the salt, um, that came from two pages that were very close to each other in my sophomore Latin book. Um, one was a little private joke, you know. But the, um, <laughs> So in that sense, I mean, I tried not to have her allude to anything I could not have alluded to when I was, say, 18 years old, um, before college. That would be the Bible that they did in the But in the Latin literature, I happened to have been exposed to because that was the language I was given in high school. Um, I, uh, one of the things that is true is that when childhood is written about, like by Dickens say, uh, it's childhood memory or whatever is not rendered in the, in the language of the child because a child's perceptions are extraordinarily vivid and complex and the child's language is not. So in order to, to actually get a faithful sense of what is remembered as child's experience, uh, an adult will use language that is as subtle as the adult can use, you know. Um, I, I think that this is uh, something that's sort of recognized in it, all writing that begins with childhood memory. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of Gilead, whether it came to you as a, a scene or a character I suddenly had this feeling in my mind that I was speaking. 
And that sounds more real. I can't quite explain how it is. It's not like hearing something. It's not an auditory illusion or something. It's a feeling of her voice. And I imagine this man sitting in a chair at a desk with a, with a little boy playing on the floor beside him. And uh, I knew that the boy was his son. He was an old man. He was writing to the boy, writing something he was to read when he was old. And uh, I don't know where the idea came from. I have no idea where the idea came from. Um, but I knew the boys very quickly as soon as he began to give me some words. Uh, you know, I mean, it's so hard to talk about these things because it sounds focus focus or something like that. But it's very, a lot of, lots of writers would I think describe pretty much the same thing here in one way or another. All my writing is voice driven. If I didn't have a voice in them, I didn't have writing. Um, and you will notice, I mean, Ruth is a voice, and, you know, that I'm not a um, I When I get an idea for a novel, I, it has a certain sort of depth. And again, that's not a very good description. But I, you know, I guess flip through my mind all the time. But every once in a while, one simply has a weight, and I know that it's not. Uh, this has happened to me three times, four times now. Um, I write when I wrote housekeeping. Um, I missed the characters from the book ending. The book ending itself. You know, they come to a point where they just say, "Well." <laughs> or it's been unreal or something like that. <laughs> um, and uh, you can feel the book closing down and you don't have any respectable aesthetic options. So anyway, after I had finished housekeeping, I missed the characters ferociously. I mean, I've been with them. They've been on my mind for you know, a year and a half. So I, I, it was very hard for me. I mean, I truly, I went through mourning. And then after Gilead, um, I had that same feeling again. And then I thought, why are we doing this? If these characters are so much on my mind, give them their novel. So I did. I never really planned to do that. But under the pressure, the clamor of, of these people that continued to walk around in my head, I gave them my novel. Then I thought, hmm, that was interesting. I still didn't feel as though I had unfolded everything that was implicit in, in, in that book. So, the third book. We have time for a couple more questions. Did it serve? You have, uh, have talked around uh, something that intrigues me. Uh, the thing I love about Gilead, I'm a clergyman, and I was, I was astounded by the way you uh, posed their thinking, because it was so much Receive that sense of sacredness uh, because uh, 
it's echoed in those uh, conversations uh, in uh, Gilead. That's an interesting question. Um, it's an interesting question. I have been driven by obsessions almost my whole life. Um, I, and they, they, they happened to me, you know, like I found out that I was incredibly interested in modern cosmologies. Way more my head, but I read everything that I can understand about them. And they're <coughs> magnificent and I can never get enough, you know. Um, I'm interested in Renaissance history, I'm interested in the ancient Near East, I'm interested, you know, all these. I mean, they're, they're a little bit random in, in their assortment, but they kind of blend together in my mind. I'd love to think what Babylonians would have thought of, you know, an issue of scientific merit, you know? <laughs> but they loved it, they loved it. But um, I think that for me, the sacred is very much associated with this kind of joy, you know? Um, I, You know, I mean, I think that we are distracted from indulging ourselves in that way. I've been very lucky because I've been uh, able to escape with much vegetation at all in my life. My parents were indulgent, etc. Um, but I think that when you when you learn something deeply, and everything that we learn is human and space, you know, we have no other access to reality. What they have found that joy, that joy is intrinsic. It's it's a true discovery. Um, I think that we're not educating people well now because we're teaching them to be, you know, one one or another relatively verified form of assembly line worker, you know. Um, and I think that you know. Assembly line workers used to approach things with more joy. You know what I mean? It's as if we have considered uh, joy or the legitimacy of deep personal immersion to be a kind of luxury that for some reason the richest society in the history of the world cannot afford. You know? Um, but I do think, I mean, for me at any rate, every time I make one of these explorations, and they become richer and richer and richer. It's like a theological experience for me, a religious experience. I feel as if I'm creating for myself a sort of celebration of, of reality, you know? And, and that anywhere you look, I mean, you can have the feeling of making bread, you know? There's so many ways to do it. But it's work, you know? I mean, it's, it's nothing, I think, that can, that happens fast. questions that I've asked and I wanted to thank them as I didn't 
um, prior. I had a really wonderful meeting with Lucia Ward and Sean Parker and uh, and Polly Kinn and probably somebody else. I feel like it's the Oscar Sunday. And I wanted to thank them for all of their help constructing some really great questions for us to ask Marilyn this evening. And then I didn't thank them, so I wanted to do that. And then I have two things that I need to say. I'll see if I can remember them. I haven't even watched me. One, there are surveys, and, and we actually said these earlier, so perhaps you were attentive if you remember, but reminders, there are uh, comment cards, not enough for everyone perhaps, but if you would fill one out, it would be great if every single one of them were filled out. That never happens. We appreciate it. And secondly, um, the wonderful Radio Bookstore is out just uh, to your right as you walk. Yeah, you will get on your, on your right to which you turn around. That way, uh, they're selling books and marijuana is signed. Yeah, and I just want to thank you all so much for being here in Maryland. Thank you. It's truly a pleasure. Thank you. So please give Maryland a chance.